Welcome to the Alexandra Wenman Show. Today I'm joined in sunny London by author and rock star turned mystic, Mr. Lars Moore. Lars, thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me here. It's absolute pleasure to have you. So I wanted to ask you, when did your first mystical experience happen and what happened? Oh, this is uh, when I was 10 years old or something. Uh, due to, my, my, to the death of my sister who died, she was six, I was 10. She, she died from a brain tumor and uh, I guess from the, uh, from the sh from that shock from her death you know a lot of weird things started to happening I started to become very very uh, sensitive uh, which meant that I was suddenly able to to uh, tap into other people's pains their worries and so I was surrounded by by pains and worries you know wow. in, in a, at the age of 10 and I, of course I could not handle it I didn't know what to, to do with it and so this was really now of course I, I understand I, I understand exactly what was happening but uh, at that time it really changed my life I didn't go to school I didn't I was not able to function really so what did your parents did you speak to your parents oh you about know it? when su such a thing happens uh, to a family uh, their parents of course they are so much taken by what happened to their uh, their, mm. their, their child you know so they had uh, too much on their plate anyway and we were working class you know so just in order to keep everything rolling you know they were you know and i think i guess that was a good thing really because mm. it it left me to to handle it on my own and i think that was much better than uh, if i was going to psychologist and having medicine and today i would probably have been you know medicated you know and everything so uh, i seen in 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 perspective i i feel that it everything was just as it was supposed to be mm. yes and do you feel that it was it, it was that that shock that sort of really opened you up yeah really yeah quickly. no doubt about it no doubt about it yeah so um, yes yes there was no doubt about that do you feel that this is something that uh, this ability to feel other people's pain is something that it's happening to humanity at the moment and sort of we're, we're going through a lot of shocking times right now aren't I think we? a lot of people are opening up I don't I hope not in in that way in that, that way. I did but but a lot of people are awakened now and in different ways and it, it's 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 all happening very quickly now it is like you know it, it's it was said many years ago we are now in the quickening so a lot of things happening very fast and you don't have to read that many books you don't have to it's more or less if you can meet people who can inspire you in order to know how to handle that opening and what to do you know because it's very simple really mm -hmm. and i think that's a message uh, for mm -hmm. our times and obviously your journey began with music what guided you into music in the first place i was just a musical kid but i never had any ambition so i I was because of, of my situation uh, I could not function so when in the 60s you know the hippie things happened and all this mm -hmm. it was like an invitation to me to here's a place that you can be in the world so actually me being in showbiz was just to have an identity to earn some money and to be here and find somebody I some mates that uh, were there exactly for the same reasons and how did you find it being so sensitive and in the public eye was it part of what you felt called to do to be mm. in that position no 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 at that time i just wanted to be exactly as everybody else you know so in order to to close down everything i in the 60s of course you know you started to playing with dope and uh, different kinds of drugs you know and and you know that made the trick <laughs> <laughs> that helped to numb it out didn't it? yeah yeah but um I, I never I never could handle drugs you know anyway so that was no the solution at all but for for time being you know I was like I could function mm -hmm. you know and obviously you're in your book the seer you talk about you know the the collapse of your musical career and kind of what led you into learning to develop your gifts can mm. you just tell our viewers a little bit about that journey oh it, it was just you know when you have a call and you don't react to that call <laughs> you will you will, you will actually at one uh, time you will get sick or you'll get something very hard on the head or something will happen that will wake you up and for me it was three years in a bed and I couldn't move or anything and um, 
After three years, it, it, it made me uh, meet the CEO. Somebody connected me to him and he got me out of bed. And from that moment, I knew that you should understand for, uh, from my 15 years, uh, when I was very young, I started studying all these things. Yeah. I've been studying all my life. But I did not really knew how to uh, incorporate it or to practice it, you know. So that was why I was uh, lying down for three years. But meeting this year, I just started practicing because that was part of his teachings, you know, mm. so there was no way out of it, you know. And how long did you work with him for? Oh, for seven years. Yes. Seven years? Until his death in 2002. Yeah. Wow, what a journey. Yeah. Do, you, do you still feel him around you as a guy? No, no, no. He yeah. left uh, years ago now. He uh, left uh, the universe and uh, he's somewhere else, yes. He's a special being. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, amazing. And when, when was your first, because you write obviously about the teachings of Jesus and Mary Magdalene and when was your first sort of awakening to, to these masters? Um, Jeshua was uh, right in when I was 18 years old. My band went to Israel for a three month uh, tour, and suddenly, you know, we were playing Nazareth, uh, Bethlehem, uh, Jerusalem, uh, and you know, <laughs> following they, the trail. They just dawned on me, oh, uh, there was something uh, I could connect to here. And so when I went to uh, Kuman at the Dead Sea, where the scenes were, were living, you know, I really felt like coming home. And from that moment on, I knew that this was something that was connected to Jeshua, the scenes and stuff. So, very early on, and in, in the, the beginning of the 80s, I started working with the Magdalene. After reading the, the Gospel of um, uh, Philip, you know, the, the famous words, saying that Mary the Magdalene was the disciple that Jesus loved the most and often kissed on the some brackets you don't know which part of the body he kissed her on but uh, I found <laughs> out later it was on the mouth and that was of course very shocking when you thought that Jesus was this weird fellow that the church have invented so I understood that Yeshua was Jesus was one thing and Yeshua re the real deal you mm -hmm. know so and I slowly I began to understand that you cannot mention Jeshua without mentioning her. Mm -hmm. And you cannot talk about her without mentioning him. So actually when I say Jeshua, I mean both of them. Or if I talk about the Magdalene, it is both of them. Both of them. Yes, and that's very crucial because this is what Christianity ought to be all about, you know. Yeah, it's the balance, isn't it? Yeah, the, the masculine and the feminine and the virgin and stuff like that. And I um, I wanted to I wanted to ask you about something that's happened personally to me. I mean, you mentioned it in your talk at the College of Psychic Studies yeah. the other night. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have had a few visions in recent years mm -hmm. of a group of women mm -hmm. uh, working, I think, underground somewhere in the dark yeah. uh, with black cloaks mm -hmm. and candles. Yeah. And these women have appeared to me a few times in my vision, and they call themselves the Magdalens. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you if you feel that they, I mean, obviously the name gives it away, they're connected to Mary Magdalene, but I wondered if you could explain a little bit more about what this might mean, if, it, if it's like a priestesshood or a lineage or to your knowledge. There's no doubt that Mariam, Mariam the Magdalene, so-called, she, she had an education and she was initiated, or else she, she, was, she was not allowed to anoint Jesus, and we know that she anointed him. So, of course, she was an, an initiated, and the Magdalene really means the, the exalted one. Mm -hmm. This is her initiation name, and there was many Magdalene's, but she was the one, the one, you know. So, uh, it makes perfect sense to have a vision of Magdalene's, mm -hmm. because there have been many of them. You should just imagine some, somebody would be uh, uh, Joan the Magdalene, or Miriam the Magdalene, Mariam the Magdalene, Sarah the Magdalene, you know, mm -hmm. and it's it, it's it told uh, that they were belonging to the same kind of lineage and uh, the same education and, and knew everything about healing, prophecy and stuff like that, you know. And when you when you worked with the seer, you worked at Montsegur, didn't you, in France? Yeah. There was a there was a story uh, that you told about that that particular mountain. Yeah. Did you share that? Yeah, the seer many times said that he, he, he had the feeling that there had been 12 women working inside of the mountain in a secret cave there. 
and we asked our friends down in Montségur, the village, village there, and but um, nobody knew anything about it. Or they didn't want to tell us about it. So some years later, I met a woman in um, in Copenhagen called Sylvia, that was predicted already here in London in 1983 that I had to meet this woman. And suddenly I meet her, uh, you know, in 2006 or something, and she told me that she was initiated inside a secret cave at Montségur. There were 12 women, you know, very shocking, you know. And uh, they were belonging to an order called the, Mo the Order of the World Mother, w which were, uh, who were working in the lineage of the moon priestesses from that exact same, the Magdalene uh, tradition. So this was, you know, like, wow, you know, and um, the stuff she told me, you know, was, you know, beyond what you could imagine about. And it really put uh, things in perspective towards the feminine principle and why the Madeline is here now, the second coming of her, you know, on, on a collective. Uh, so it all makes perfect sense. Uh, I'm going to France uh, for Magdalene's feast day with a group of friends and I wondered if you could give us some tips about where it might be good to, to visit to follow in Magdalene's footsteps and any of your own experiences that you've had in that area. Oh, there's many places really and, and you know, it's very, very difficult also because about friends, you know, because we, it's pure speculation if Mac, the Magdalene went there at all. Mm. She probably did, and she probably didn't, you know. And but there is a tradition there after her, and um, that's the thing that you you can you can investigate. But I always tell people when they go there, follow your own instinct, follow your own intuition, because that's much better, and it'll bring you places where maybe nobody else has been before, mm. and you will uh, connect to whatever you need to connect to there. Mm. I think that was, is much better. <laughs> and so you've studied Aramaic rather extensively, haven't you? Yeah. How, how does this language, I've read somewhere that this language is actually the key to unlocking the, the real truth of the New Testament in the Bible. Exactly. How does this language as a kind of sacred language help to unlock some of the truths that are actually contained in the Bible? You should imagine that the, the, the Gospels was written in that language. Mm -hmm. And if you, if I tell you that every every uh, word can have up to eight different meanings pointing in each direction, you know, be opposite each other, then we understand, then we begin to understand how difficult it must have been for those who wanted to translate it into Greek. Mm -hmm. And if they didn't know how to handle this uh, language and didn't know the depth of it, how should they? What should they go for? You know. So that is why a lot of the, the translations are completely, does, it doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. Because if you want to translate, you need, there is a, a tool called Midrash in Aramaic. That means you, you have to find the essence of all the meaning, meeting, meanings mm -hmm. and, and kind of develop a new expression for what they are talking about. So, so many things are hidden in there. Mm -hmm and you need that key in order to unlock it. Mm -hmm. And when you have that key, you, you, you really understand that the New Testament is a tantric, tantric scripture, really. Mm -hmm. And it's not about crucifixion and all these things. It's about the merging of the masculine and the feminine. It's about the bridal chamber. Mm -hmm. And that's a complete other story. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we find within ourselves, of isn't course. it? Of yes, mm. yes, yes, yes. You have to find the balance of the masculine and feminine. I mean, in, in the Gospel of Luke, the Jesuit says, if you're looking for the kingdom of heaven, look inside of yourself because of there is. It's not an obscure place upstairs, it's within you. Mm. So that makes the whole difference. Mm. You know? So, in a sense, the Holy Grail is, is really finding that, that yeah, wisdom yeah, and that course, sovereignty course, within yeah, yourself. No doubt, isn't it? Of course. Amazing. <laughs> um, so, in terms of the Aramaic, you speak a lot about the the uh, in the law in the law of light, the mm. book, the law of light. You mm. speak about Aramaic as, mm. you know, as a, a kind of an activating language. Mm. How mm. can people connect to that language themselves and use it, I suppose, in a way that is sacred? 
you don't need to you don't need to to actually learn to speak the, the language but you you need to understand the psychology behind the language that's what it's all about a few phrases uh, are still left in Aramaic in the New Testament even in the English edition for example every time um, Jesus is healing uh, people he's using the the expression ephatar 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 and ephatar means open up um, soften everything any everything that is stiffened um, release anything that is captured or bound you know or whatever you call it so ephatar is is, is really an opening tool, in a, a tool in order to open the ears of the deaf and the eyes of the blind and stuff like that. And it's very effective. You, you, you can use that when you, if you are working as a therapist with healing. And there are so many tools you, you actually can use as this very effective praying and stuff like that. With the Ephata, would you... Would you uh, would you think that it's quite powerful to sing those phrases or yeah, to tone yeah, yeah, those yeah. phrases? Yeah, yeah, of course, yes, yes, yes. Mm. You, you, oh, whatever you do, the most important thing is intent. Mm. What are your intentions? Mm. How do how do you want to use this? Where do you direct it? These things are whatever tradition you're working in is you know. In in another really really peculiar thing about the Aramaic language is there's no expression for sin and you know if you take sin this is really the the stone of the the grounding stone of the church you know mm. and the, the christianity as we know it so to to be a sinner is really talking about a person who is not present mm. and if you're not present you miss the mark yeah. you cannot su succeed in anything and uh, in the same way as, as uh, the kingdom of heaven is inside of you and me and everybody else, hell, there's no hell below us. It is state also a, yeah, mm -hmm. a state of being, you know, and it means to be beside oneself. Mm. So when we are not present, we are actually in hell. And how often do we use that phrase? I was beside myself. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah, that's what, it's a key one. I was not there, you know. Yeah. And that was why things will not Coming to yeah. alignment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Alignment is, is really a good expression for it. Yeah, and that's why that a lot of the uh, the tools that, that meditation teaches is coming yeah. back into yeah, 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 yeah. coming to that, mm, that sovereign exactly. space, that, that, <laughs> that calm, that peace. Yeah. That's beautiful. Mm. And um, with uh, with regards to sound, you're married to Gita Van David yeah. and uh, she's obviously a very, very prevalent sound healer mm, and musician yeah, yeah, yeah. and music's obviously a huge part of your life. What do you think is uh, is so important about sound for healing? How does sound come into the healing so powerfully? Sound was a very, very important part of the mystery schools, both of Jeshua and the Magdalene and all the old mystery schools. They knew all about uh, how to to what kind of sound to use for this and that you know and yeah it was very very important part mm. really mm. so so Gita had, had been working for 30 years with that you know and invented a, a kind of uh, what do you call it a, a therapist uh, therap uh, therapeutic um, thing called the note from heaven mm. it's very effective Mm. And you've made a film about that. Yes, yes, yes. Wonderful. And you can see that film on, what is your website? On, on Vimeo. Vimeo. Yeah, yeah. dot com. And Just what's that? You have a, a little TV uh, portal, don't you? That, yeah. That, that film is also seen through. Yeah. It's Cos uh, Cosmoporter. Cosmoporter. Dot net. net. Yeah. Cosmoporter dot net. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, so if you want to see that film, you can mm. go on cosmoporter.net and you'll see it. Yeah. It's one. Have you gone back to your music? Do you play music now still? Yeah, to, together with Gita, we, we go out and do concerts. Also with our boys, we, we go out and do concerts and songs and stuff like that. Yeah. It, it's part of your, it's part yeah, of, yeah, part yeah, of yeah, who yeah. you are, I exactly, suppose. Exactly, yeah. Wonderful. So you often get Mother Mary depicted in the kind of blue and white colors and Mary Magdalene depicted more with the red and the, the kind of darker colors. What's the significance of the color representations? Oh, these things are, th this is not something that I've really been into, you know. You cannot uh, <laughs> be everywhere, you know, but, but uh, 
it's it, you know there's always a kind of I think it in order to uh, when the artists were pa uh, uh, painting these figures archetypes they needed something that could uh, uh, define the one from the other you know mm. so that that is why I think. yeah and obviously Mary was kind of representing the purity and the light yeah. and then Magdalene was More the whore the, in the, the Bible the, the, the earthly one you know. yeah. yeah if we look at it it's also yeah. the uh, I suppose the wild woman, isn't mm, it? That side exactly, of that yeah. side of the feminine, mm. and they're both so valid. And uh, you've appeared in Watkins' books, a hundred most influential people, mm -hmm. uh, spiritual people, and I think you've almost you've also met many other spiritual teachers, including the Dalai Lama. Mm. Who do you find in inspiring? Who are the who are the the spiritual teachers that you find uh, the most inspiring? It, it is uh, to me. There's no doubt. It's Yeshua and the Magdalene, mm. and because every day is just like new revelation. You know, I'm not really. I'm not feeling really part of uh, the new kind of what do you f call it? The new kind of uh, spiritual community in that sense. You know, I. I really. I think that there is a tendency to to create a kind of royalty within mm. it, you know, and a kind of, uh, you know, when... Like a hierarchy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, I think the times are over yeah. for that, you know. We, we, we need to, everybody has something to, to, uh, to share, you know, and uh, I, you know, when we met just before you came up at the station, you know, there's, there's a homeless man lying there, you know, most people pass him by, but you know maybe he's the wise man of yeah. today. You don't, you don't yeah. know. And I often stop and and, and, and talk to these people because uh, a lot of them have uh, very very exciting stories, mm. you know, to tell and a lot of wisdom there, you know. So um, I d I'm not uh, so much for all these uh, lists no of the hundred, the hundred <laughs> best and yeah. this and that. I mean, it's a little bit ridiculous, you know. Yeah. Seen from my perspective. Yeah. Yeah, because we, we all hold wisdom and of we all course. have access to that wisdom, yes, don't yes, we? Yes, yes, yes. Fantastic. So you're obviously very in tune with sort of multi-dimensional consciousness and different levels of awareness and things like that. Have you ever come into contact with any masters or beings that have not incarnated on the earth plane? Oh, I, I would rather I would uh, rather call it, uh, you know, different kind layers of consciousness uh, levels of consciousness these things are very hard to um, define I think and uh, put into words you know F to me it's more like you you delve into certain kinds of consciousness levels and mm. give into that levels of your own yeah. your own psyche really isn't it? Ah, yeah maybe mm. and with uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the term language of light the, the language of light. Language of yeah, light. Yeah, yeah. Do you believe that Aramaic is linked to this language of light? Yeah, to me there's no doubt. Yeah. Mm. One mm. of the sacred yeah, kind of yeah, languages. Yeah, of course, yes, really. Yeah. And there's yeah. something behind the phonetics of some of these languages, isn't there? Ah, you know, we haven't, we have only seen the beginning of this. You really ought to go to, to, uh, to Israel and visit some of the Kabbalists that are sitting there. You know, there's so many hidden people there that you even haven't heard about. Uh, rabbis that are also below some of the, the 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 best and cleverest mathematicians of the world. Nobody really knows. And they're sitting there, both being scientists and really into their study in, in Kabbalah. So there's so much going on there that is beyond what we are even started to think about. You know? Once you start unraveling it's like going yeah. down the rabbit hole. And it's, it's all about the anime. Mm. So I expect that in a not so far away future that uh, there will be some revelations from there. Fantastic. Mm. And in terms of what's going on on our our planet at the moment, this quickening. Yeah. What what would you like to say to viewers about what's happening on the planet right now? Yeah, what could I say that could make any sense? You know, except from if you are awake and start to practice. You know, because practice is something to have the 
what do you call it when you you uh, anyway to practice you know um, have a daily yeah yeah and and I would rather say five minutes where you're completely present in what you're doing instead of hours where you're going here and there and everywhere and trying five ten minutes you know where you're really into your thing mm. while you're doing it and I, I think just also to be present in everyday life in whatever you're doing towards your children towards your the people you meet you know to be there just be here yeah. be here now yeah marvelous and Lars how can people get hold of you or find out more about your work oh from reading my books <laughs> we've got some of the books here so I'm just gonna hold them up so this is obviously the uh, the big one yeah the three the trilogy <coughs> of uh, the seer the Magdalene and the Grail imagine this is uh, now an old book because yeah. it was out in Denmark in 2000 yeah. so it's it's uh, quite where did, where did these years go mm. and obviously this is the, uh, the 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 next one coming out there's a story about this picture isn't there oh yeah 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 it, was given to me in 2000, Ella, in, 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 in 1983, and this silver I mentioned before um, was the one who brought it to, to Denmark. And it, it is really a picture of the world mother uh, containing all the. the um, it was a channel picture wow. from, from within the order of the world mother. And uh, it is actually the lineage of the Magdalene and Isis. And so all that divine yeah, feminine yeah. wrapped yes, up yeah. into yeah. one image. Yeah. How powerful, really powerful image. Thank you so much, Lars. Yeah, thank you for taking me to Green Park. It's my first time in Green Park. Oh, wow, I'm so pleased <laughs> yeah. that you've come to meet us here. And, it, you know, it's uh, yeah. such a beautiful day. I think you've brought the weather with you. Mm. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your time in London. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Can I give you a hug? <laughs> thank you. <laughs>